around a table or the couch in the living room, in a coffee shop or at the park, at work, at school. This is where you'll find us. We're brothers and sisters, family and friends, old and young, brought together for a purpose. We learn and we share. We serve one another. We give what we have, our joys and our sorrows, our hopes and our dreams, and we all have a part to play. And while we are different, there is more that unites us than tears us apart. And when we come together, something beautiful happens. We are one, and we are glad to be The Gathering. Amen. Welcome to The Gathering. What is The Gathering? It's the body of Christ. It's the church. It's not one particular church over another. It's just the people of God coming together. And I know for some of you, the only way to be with us is, is by streaming. I, we're glad we have the opportunity to stream everything that happens. But as I always would say, when you are physically able, don't miss the gathering. Don't miss being here. Last week, my wife and I were traveling. We took our oldest son to Yellowstone. And so we were out in Wyoming, and, and man, just beautiful, absolutely. But I got to stream and be a part, and I just missed being here. Because of the incredible atmosphere, there's something about being out there. When I would take a picture at Yellowstone of God's incredible creation, and then we'd come back and I'd show it to somebody, they would go, oh, oh, that's nice. And I'm looking at the picture going, oh, gosh, I'm sorry, I can't capture what I, it's bigger than what a little picture says. Well, can I just tell you the gathering is bigger than a stream. It's even bigger than a service. You heard David say, it's God is working all over, and He is stirring. If you are here today and, and, and you're intrigued with what's happening in this place, you may not have ever been here, or maybe you have, can I invite you to something we have right after this service called Donuts with David? Now, the, the obvious from that title is you're going to get donuts and you're going to get me. That, I, that's two things I know. What you're going to hear is what this is all about. What do we value? What do we, what do we want you to know about us? And we want to know about you. Just what the nature of the gathering is. We need each other. And so we want you to find a home and find a place And if I could tell you anything about us, there's one thing about every one of us. We once were dead in trespasses and sin, but He brought us back to life. He changed our life, and now we are alive in Him for His glory. Hey, I want you to stand with me. Let's celebrate who we are. Nope, we're not dead. We are alive in Christ. Let's worship Him.
what you've done for me Jesus to fully praise you it will take all eternity and just like Lazarus oh Amen. Thank you, guys. Hey, you may be seated. If we could tell you anything about what it means to be a part of the gathering, that's what we'd tell you. We were once dead. Now we live. What does that mean? Well, we were separated from the Creator who loved us and had a plan for our life, but our sin separated us. And one day we realized that Jesus came to this earth to die for our sin. And it was only through Jesus that we could come back to the place God intended us to be from the beginning. And so in that moment when we said yes to Christ, it's like we died and He came alive in us. So now the reason we rejoice, the reason we celebrate the way we do, is we are alive in Christ. Now, as a part of being that kind of a gathering, there are times when our heart is broken. There are times when we're moved by something happening in the world, and David already mentioned it today. There's a place for us to stand against injustice and always to stand against terrorism. Always. And so I just want you to join us in a prayer for what happened in Israel and pray for the wisdom of Israel to know and how to respond and, and, and all that goes into that. And I know that not every person who is Palestinian is connected to Hamas. I know that they don't necessarily believe and serve the same principles. So we pray for them because they live in a very tough place. But Paul said we're in a war. It's a spiritual war. And that spiritual war is not with flesh and blood, but with powers. And David said it right. It's darkness. And wherever you find terrorism, that's darkness. And my prayer has been, God, you have had victory in that land before. God, would you have victory again now? Would you restore what is right, what is true, what is just? So I know you're joining us in that prayer. Hey, if you want to be a part, two things. is First, to pray. Secondly, giving. Uh, let me just, as we always say, there's a lot of things that pop up, and you'll see them on social media. Hey, give to this. We're going to be able to serve, whatever. And I'm sure there's a lot of great ones, but there's one we trust. There's one that represents a network of churches that we're a part of. It's called Sin Relief. And it is located and housed in the ministry called the North American Mission Board 
led by one of our close friends, one of my close friends, and I know that when we give to that sin relief, it's going to be there. It's going to be in the right places. So let me encourage you, if you want to give, you can go on our website, and there's a way for you to access what would be a great way to do that. Now, I want us just to pray for a moment. Two things. We're praying for Israel. We're praying for those who were affected such in such terrible, dramatic ways. But I also want to pray that the Lord will give us wisdom from His Word, that God will teach us today. Because I don't mind telling you straight up, this is one of the most difficult passages. I mean, I, there's so many things. I, I would... I would tell you that it's more challenging even than figuring out, figuring out when Jesus is coming back again. Because I kind of leave that with him. He knows. But this is a word to the gathering, to the church. And I want to make sure we hear what he has to say. So let's pray. Father, we know that your heart is broken at evil. Your heart is broken by what happened in Israel. Father, I pray that, God, you would restore your righteousness and justice. And, God, I, I pray that we will walk with compassion to those who are affected. And also, I, I just want to pray, Father, bring your word to life. Help us understand what we need to know as we gather in this wonderful thing we call the body of Christ. So thank you, Lord. Speak to us in Jesus' name. Amen. So have you ever gotten a gift that was filled with wrapping and a bunch of paper? And as you're excited and you're trying to carry on a conversation, and it's like, come on, folks, how much wrapping do you need for a gift? And you just keep pulling paper out. Finally, down there somewhere, Somewhere, ah, there's a gift, right? Today, I don't want you to get hung up on the wrapping. I don't want us to get hung up on debating, okay, well, what does that mean and how do we? There's a lot of wrapping that's cultural around what we're going to read together. But I promise you, there's a beautiful gift in there. And sometimes in our world, we start fighting over the wrapping. We start analyzing the wrapping. And as Christians, we're like, well, I don't know. I, I think this belongs here. I, the wrapping, it's okay. Don't miss the gift. How many of you ever given a gift to one of your children, and instead of playing with the gift, they played with the box? Let me see, can I get a witness there? <laughs> Guys, let's grow up. We don't need to be playing with the box. Play with the gift. That's what God wants us to know. Let me summarize where we're going. I'll make it real quick. Three things that I want you to understand from the text that we're about to read together. God has arranged the church to reflect His glory. He has arranged the church to reflect His glory. In other words, God loves order. He is not a God of confusion. There is a word in Greek that you've never heard, but the Latin word for it is decorum. Any of you know what decorum means? It just means order, appropriateness. And I just believe God has arranged His church with order, even though there may be some things we don't understand. He, he wants us to know today that this is a gift from God, and this place should reflect His glory. Second thing, God has gifted the church to accomplish the mission of his church. He's given you, every one of you, there's a place for you here. You may say, but you don't even know me. I don't have to know you. You are a created being, and God loves you, and God seeks to redeem you, and when he redeems you, he pours into you gifting that the church needs. So we have a place for you. There's a home here. Come to Donuts and David and get a donut, and we'll talk about that. The last one, the gathering should be a reflection of him more than a reflection of the world around us. You know, I don't know about you, but out there, there's discord. 
Out there at work, there's disunity. There's fighting over this, fighting over that. There's arguing over this, arguing over that. I mean, it's just constant. And there's a lot of stuff out there that I, it's just hard for me to embrace. But let me tell you what, that is not what the church is to be. The church is to be a reflection of His glory and to draw people and let them find something different than what's in the world around them. So I just think these are the things you got to get, okay? So with a Bible open, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, we're about to hit it, and I'm going to read straight through. I will tell you that the centerpiece of this, and I think the reason it is is because there are people who read this passage, and they're going to walk away saying, oh, well, then it means that women have no place, or it means that women are, I mean, men are in charge, and they have dominion over women. No, 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 no. In fact, he makes sure you don't go there, and this is what he says in verse 11 and 12. Let me start there. I think it's the theme. Nevertheless, what does that mean is, even though you don't understand what I just said, listen. In the Lord, woman is not independent of man, nor man of woman. For as woman was made from man, so man is now what? Born of woman, and all things are from God. So, ladies and gentlemen, we all belong here. We all have a part to play. And not one side is better than the other. We all share the image of God. Can we give him thanks for that? Just to say, God, thank you that there is that kind of fabric in the body. All right, verse 2. Here we go. I'm going to read straight through. And I'm going to be tempted to pause, and if I do, it's okay. Now, I commend you because you remember me in everything and maintain the traditions even as I delivered them to you. See, i got to stop. Okay. <laughs> you see that word, tradition? It's just what was handed to Paul from the teaching of Jesus and then through the apostles. Okay, it's not law, it's not rabbinic tradition, it's not Old Testament tradition just what the church was beginning to do. All right, press on. I'll get back to it. I'm going to read off of this because it's too important. I want, to, I want to stay with you. But I want you to understand that the head of every man is Christ, the head of a wife is her husband, and the head of Christ is God. Let's keep going. For every man who prays or prophesies with his head covered dishonors his head, but every, time, or every wife who prays or prophesies with her head uncovered dishonors her head, since it is the same as if her head were shaven. For if a wife will not cover her head, then she should cut her hair short. But since it is a disgrace or disgraceful for a wife to cut off her hair or shave her head, let her cover her head. We'll come back to that. Just hang on. For a man ought not to cover his head, since he is the image and glory of God. But woman is the glory of man. Hang on, ladies. We'll be back to that one. For man was not made from woman, but woman from man. Neither was man created for woman, but woman for man. That is why a wife ought to have a symbol of authority on her head because of the angels. By the way, that's the toughest phrase in the whole thing, because of the angels. But we'll get there. Nevertheless, in the Lord, woman is not independent of man, nor man of woman. For as a woman was made from man, so man is now born of woman. And all things are from God. Judge for yourselves. Is it proper for a wife to pray to God with her head uncovered? Does not nature teach you that if a man wears long hair, it is a disgrace for him? My father used to like to quote that. Uh, but if a woman has long hair, it is her glory. For her hair is given to her for a covering. If anyone is inclined to be contentious, we have no such practice, nor do the churches of God. God, would you bless this and help us understand what in the world you're saying? That's my prayer. Okay, now, you and I both live in a world where when we travel, sometimes we go to a culture we have never been to, and we don't understand some of the cultural things. Have you ever been in a culture where you did something inappropriate and you didn't even know you did something inappropriate? Anybody? Let me get a witness. All right. 
We'll have a testimony time next week. You're going to be able to share what it was. I'll tell you mine. So I was in Thailand, and I was working with missionaries from South Asia, and we had a group from here over there, and, and we had a challenge to give thanks to somebody who'd been serving us all week. And there was this Thai young lady that all she did was stand at the escalator. It was an escalator. And all she did was help us as Americans not fall down on the escalator. She just stood there and helped us. And was the sweetest thing, smile and, you know, very gracious, as most of the Thai culture is. Well, I just thought, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give her thanks. I'm going to say something to her. Now, this is before The Bachelor. This is before The Bachelorette. This is before Bachelor in Paradise. This is before The Golden Bachelor. They told us to give a rose to somebody. I said, hey, I, I'll do that. I'll give a rose to her to say thank you. So I, I got to the bottom of the escalator, and I hand the rose to her. <laughs> and she couldn't understand. I couldn't. I don't speak Thai. I'm sorry. I don't speak Thai. A line from a movie just went through my head. So I, I said, for you. And this is what I did. For you. She was horrified. In the Thai culture, you don't point to somebody. That is terribly offensive. So when her countenance fell, I'm, I remembered. Of course I remembered after I did it. I'm like, oh, my goodness. Then I'm trying to make up for it. I'm trying to back out of that and dig out of that, and there was no way. I just didn't know. There are some things about this that we, we just don't know. And it has to do with hair. It has to do with head covering. So let me summarize. There's some keys in here. One is, what is the meaning of head and what is the meaning of, of the word wife or woman? And, and how do these interplay? Is Paul trying to say something about a woman or a wife? And then it's still about head. I'm going to take you back to verse 3 just because I think it bears a little bit of a a reference. The head of man is Christ. The head of wife is her husband, and the head of Christ is God. The word head is the, the Greek word kephale. I wrote a paper on this when I was out, it, it was a, in a PhD seminar, and I just remember the complexity of this. And, and guys, I'll tell you, it's, it's six on this side and six on another. It's really a divided subject. Here are the possible meanings of the word head. Source, Authority, blessing, covering, protector. And you're looking at me and going, okay, so which one do you think it is? My answer is yes, yes. <laughs> There's a sense in which it's describing the relationship of all of those. As a woman embraces it, as a man embraces it, and even as Christ. So if it just means submission, if it just means inferiority, we got a problem here. Christ is God, is head of Christ is God. The Trinity is asymmetrical. That, that means all equal. But yet somehow there's a role that Christ played in honor of the Father. So what I think he's saying to us is that in a relationship, and by the way, I think the translation of the word wife or woman should be wife. And I think what happens is when we try to make general blanket statements for women in general, when Paul intended it to be in a marriage relationship, we get into some real issues. I think he's talking about a wife. I think he's talking about a relationship. And he presents this beautiful picture that, yes, there's a role that a wife plays and there's a role that a husband plays. And is the husband to be a leader? Yes. Is she to be one who honors him and respects him? Yes, the Scripture teaches that. But does that mean he dominates over her? He's more important than her. He is superior. She's in fear. Not a chance in the world. In fact, Genesis 5, verse 1 and 2 says, they are both equal in made in the image of God. But do we have different roles? Yes, we do. You know what my best picture of marriage and kind of what Paul is talking about? How many of you love to slow dance? 
Any slow dance? Anybody in here just love to slow dance with your, with your husband, with your wife? You know, you're afraid. I saw some elbowing going on in that moment. <laughs> yeah. Well, let me tell you, I, I didn't grow up dancing. Every dance I went to, I was a, going against the will of my parents because we grew up Baptist back in the day when Baptists thought that the worst thing you could ever do is dance. In fact, the reason we were against adultery is because it might lead to dancing. So it was just really a mess. But I love to slow dance. Every once in a while, I'll put music on, and Rachel and I will slow dance. I'm not good, but I like it. Do you know what I know about slow dance? Somebody leads and somebody follows, but we move together as one. And you really can't tell who's leading. I think a husband ought to be a servant leader. I think he ought to love his wife as Christ loved the church. And so I think as a husband does that, what does a wife do? She honors that role, and she plays the role God has given her in respect and submission, which is a word that, ironically, he says we ought to all submit to one another in Ephesians 5.22. So he's talking about this beautiful relationship, okay, between a husband and a wife, and he takes it back to the, the beginning. Now, let's move to the next thing. What about this head covering thing? Then what's going on with the head covering? Because that looks like something that we're, where did that come from? Verse 4, every man who prays or prophesies with his head covered dishonors his head. But every wife who prays or prophesies with her head un- uncovered dishonors her head. Since it is the same as if her head were shaven, for if a wife will not cover her head, then she should cut her hair short. But since it is disgraceful for a wife to cut her off her hair or shave her head, let her cover her head. Okay, where in the world and what in the world is that? I want to give you some of the backdrop. Corinth was a crazy place. The church was in the middle of that craziness. One of the things Corinth was known for is immorality, sexual immorality to be exact. There was a temple of Aphrodite up on the hill right by Corinth. Those prostitutes, and there are historians, Roman historians, that say a thousand of them would come down. How did you know if it was a prostitute? You didn't want to mistake a normal lady on the street for a woman of the night. You know what the difference was? Their hair. If they had short hair, it's most likely a prostitute. If they shaved their head, it was for sure. A prostitute. In other words, it was a way of advertising. And men knew it. So in that culture, Paul knew, man, don't. We can't have women looking like they're walking the street. And so they need to look different and honor God. The second thing, what he's talking about is in the context of worship services. Okay? Worship services. In other words, when a woman stands to prophesy or to pray. I think this is fascinating. Women were speaking. Women were preaching, prophesying. It's a word that, that, that means prophesying or speaking. When they would, they need to make sure that they honored God first. And I think the covering had to do with God first. But then I think it also meant they were in a covenant relationship and it honored their husband, it'd be like, ladies, you wearing a wedding ring today. If your wife refuses to wear her wedding band, guys, we have a counseling center. It's right (laughs) over here. Why would she not want to identify with you? So when a woman stood in that moment of public worship to prophesy or to pray, she wanted to be very careful that she honored not only her heavenly father, but she honored that man in her life. When we were on the plane, my wife and I got a chance, as I said, to go to Yellowstone, and we had a great time. We were flying back this week, and man, I've been living this passage for a long, I've been reading everybody that I know of and some guys I'd never heard of, trying to just understand, God, what are you saying? And I had it laid out on my little table in the middle of the flight from, from out west, and Rachel's sitting on the window, in the window seat. I'm in the middle. And then Joshua, our son, was on the other side. And so as I've got all this stuff laid out, Rachel looked over at one of the articles I was reading, and the title of the article was, Should a Woman Cover Her Head to Honor God? 
And so she saw it, <laughs> and you just got to know Rachel. She, she, she may not say a lot, but when in she speaks, you better listen, and it, she is hilarious. She looked at that, and she took her hoodie and pulled her hoodie up <laughs> over her head, and she leaned over and took a nap. So do I believe this morning we need to bring head coverings out for women? Actually, I do. The ushers have them. Come on, guys, and, and let's hand them out. No. Does this, is this where wearing hats came from? Could be. It could be a tradition that was influenced by this. So why don't we require women to cover their head when they are on this platform? Because Abby sang a minute ago, she didn't have a head covering. You know why? Because our culture doesn't misunderstand it. It's not a cultural thing here. It was there. And the most important thing, God wants to honor the body of Christ as a reflection of himself. So in a given culture, I tell you, there are some things we wouldn't want on this platform. Why? Because it would dishonor God. Because in our culture, it's, that's just not what we do. We live in Florida. We have beaches. So should the worship team up here, the girls, wear their swimsuits? It's cultural. I only saw one hand, and I'm not going to comment on that one hand. And the answer is no. Why? Because we know it's not appropriate in light of reflecting God's glory that in a worship moment and a worship leader would be in that attire. I mean, we don't believe in swimsuits. No, we believe in swimsuits. It's just there is something about decorum. There's something about order. There's something about how God arranges the body. So that's what he's saying. But then there's this really tough verse, verse 7, about glory. This kind of fun. For a man ought not to cover his head since he is the image and glory of God. And the woman is the glory of man. What is that about? I know he's not saying that only men are in the image of God, women are not. By the way, who was created first? Who? Men. Where did we come from? The dirt. Now, I know, men, you want to say dust, but let's be honest, it's dirt. Okay? Where did women come from? Our side, a rib. So, ladies, next time your husband gives you trouble, just say, dirt bag, you might want to back up just a minute there. I'm just telling you, that's how it started. That's where we came from. So what Paul is trying to say here is that the glory, you know what glory is? It means delight. Look at the way it says it. Since he is the image and glory of God, what does that mean? God delighted in Adam when he created Adam. He was delighted. He said everything is good until what? He saw Adam was alone. Adam had a need. So what did he do? He caused Adam to fall asleep. And while he took a nap that afternoon, God reached in and took a rib, made the most incredible creation. Now remember, Adam's named every creature. All the rhinos, all the giraffes, all the elephants. He's named them all. And the Bible says there wasn't one that was suitable. But on that afternoon when Adam woke up, oh my, he saw one that wasn't Miss Rhino, wasn't Miss Giraffe. It was the most beautiful thing he'd ever seen. And his delight was in her. That's where the word glory comes in. So glory just means delight. We delight in what God has given us. And we delight in what he has done and what he is doing in the body of Christ. And that final verse, those final verses, where he moves beyond the woman prophesying. And well, I actually go back because I just saw something. Everybody wonders. No, go one back. Sorry. Symbol of authority. A wife ought to have a symbol of authority on her head because of the angels. Can I just tell you that phrase? is one of the most difficult phrases to interpret. What do the angels have to do with it? By the way, I'm, I'm going to give a shot, okay? <laughs> Believe me, this is, I don't put my feet in concrete on this. What are angels? Number one, they're messengers. 
Number two, are they male or female in gender when they occur in the biblical text? They're all male or in the masculine gender. So could it be that God wanted to say to the angels, I have called her to be a spokesperson too. She is my anointed also. So to demonstrate and be a witness to them, she was to have that covering to honor not only her husband, but to honor God. It, I'm telling you, we don't know for sure. We just know that Paul said there's got to be that order. And the last few verses, he talks about having hair, and it's wrong. Go to those last uh, few verses. Judge for yourselves. In other words, just look around. Is it proper for a wife to pray to God with her head uncovered? And the obvious answer for the Corinthians would have been no. She really shouldn't. Why? Because that covering, as she led in a prayer, made her stand out from the women of Corinth who would look very, very different. And it also sent a message. She was not only in a relationship with God, she was in a relationship with her husband. And then, does it not teach you or nature not teach you that if a man wears long hair, is a disgrace for him in that culture? Yes. In our culture, no. There's nothing about hair that speaks volumes the way it spoke volumes in Corinth. Because I'm looking at some ladies that have short hair. So could we just pause and pray for your repentance right now? Can we just ask them? <laughs> your short hair means nothing. Let, I'll tell you, you want to you just stretch this out? What about a woman who's going through chemo? She loses her hair. Does that dishonor God? No. No. See, you got to be careful that you don't take these things and you apply them today in such a way you're, you're, you're missing the gift and you're messing with the wrapping paper. The wrapping paper is different today. But that gift is the same. And so I would say, back to the three things. God arranges the church to reflect His glory. And not only that, He's gifted the church to accomplish the mission of His church. He has gifted you. You say, but I'm a woman. He's gifted you. Use your gifts. It is not wise for us to put me in the preschool area. That's not my gift. But it's wise for us to put Rachel there. I think we have to be very careful that we don't disallow a woman or man to serve in certain areas just because of their gender. Because remember, God says, I've arranged the body and gifted the body the way it should be to accomplish the mission of the church. And the third thing, the gathering should be a reflection of him more than a reflection of the world around us. I just want whenever somebody from Orlando walks in here, they go, wow, this is not what I expected. This is not what I expected. Or I want them to say, man, this is so refreshing because out there it's like we fight all the time and we're always doing things to one another and questioning one another. You walk in here, there's a sense of peace. And I can tell you what brings that sense of peace, and that is that the Lord Jesus brought us together. He changed our life, brought us back to life. And there's one name above every name. So today, the first step to be a part of something like the church is to put your faith and trust in Jesus. And if you're on this stream or in this room and you've never given your life to Christ, that is the first step. It's the greatest step. Because when you do that, then all of a sudden He comes in and He changes you. And then you realize, I do have a home. I do have people who love me. I have people that share in common. We didn't grow up in the same world or the same place or the same generation. But man, we know the same Jesus. And there's something beautiful about that. And we'd like for you to know him. So I just want to lead you in a quick prayer. And I want you to say this. Jesus, there are a lot of things I don't understand about you. Tell him. Be honest. There are a lot of things I don't understand about you. There's one thing I do understand. You love me. 
And you came and died on the cross for me. And you want to be my Lord and my Savior. And today, Jesus, I invite you to come take my life. I'm going to follow you the rest of my days. Thank you, Jesus, for help, helping me turn from a life of sin and confusion and helping me find peace in you, in Jesus' name. Now look this way. I just believe that that's where it all starts. And then some of you say, well, I've, I've already done that. I, I'm a Christian, but I, I'm not plugged in. I don't have a home. I'm not spiritually at home anywhere. I just beg you, be a part of the gathering. And we can help you with that. What we want you to do, even if you prayed that prayer a minute ago, is text the word NEXT to 40777, and we'll have someone that will kind of help you to come alongside you and say, hey, this is, this is what we can do to help. I just want you to never forget this. Jesus has done something for us that we'll never be able to fully thank him for. Because the Bible said we were lost, we were separated, we were dead in our trespasses and sin. But what did he do? He brought us back to life. And he gave us life. Can we stand together and let's close this service singing just a portion of that again. Thank you, Jesus, for bringing us back to life. How can I begin to thank you for all that you've done for me? And Jesus, to fully praise you, it will take all eternity.